thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure. Is this working? Yeah. It's a pleasure to be back in Poland. Uh, the spring uh, is gorgeous out there, and um, it was a lovely walk from the hotel here. And I want to. Uh, I enjoyed the walk. It was a, a bit of history from, uh, forgive me, but Stalinist Poland in uh, the uh, McCurr uh, Grand Hotel uh, through to lovely street scenes and, and bits of history. Uh, now this will make, oh yes. <laughs> and so today. Uh, and, and, and then the lovely market scene uh, on the way to, to, the, uni to the university. Uh, was, was lovely. There were uh, uh, accordion players uh, begging for money, unfortunately, but um, it was clearly a, a, a sister and brother playing in tune beautifully in key, and it was, it was, it was delightful. Uh, and so I want to take a slightly different uh, approach. Uh, you have had the long and the short of open access. You have had the wide and the open. Um, of open access, and I want to follow on, yes, Cameron's uh, theme of, of being broader, uh, but I want to move in a historical direction. Uh, I haven't been involved in open access as long as Stephen, uh, but I have been involved longer than Cameron, uh, only because I'm much, much older than Cameron. <laughs> um, and I have, uh, in that period of time, about 15 years, uh, I have been passionate and committed, perhaps not as much as my uh, colleague and compatriot, but I have um, seen this as the right way to go. And uh, I have come to a point after 15 years of saying to myself, uh, pausing, it took 15 years for me to pause, uh, and say to myself, uh, but why? Why did I expect all of the research and scholarship in the world to be freely available? What is different about this intellectual property from other intellectual property. And so in the last few years, more than a few in fact, last five years, I've been working on this question of trying to understand where this idea came from, why we would expect research not to be free. There's still an expense involved, and I appreciate the previous speakers referencing this. Stephen in particular was being exacting around the costs of these things. They are there. They're not the current levels, perhaps. So why is it that we can think about this in a different way? Because right now, intellectual property is one size fits all. My favorite uh, Canadian examples, I am a, a Canadian working in the United States. It's a pleasure and a duty. Include the work of, of Justin Bieber. How is it that his songs, or Leonard Cohen, or Neil Young, or Joni Mitchell, we have quality in our country as well. <laughs> I'm very proud this year, Nobel Prize wise, we were talking at dinner last night, the Nobel Prize in literature for perhaps another half year belongs in Canada with Alice Munro. So how is it that Alice and Justin and Neil and Joni, how is it that their intellectual property is the same? Why don't we have open access for them? How is it that it is a crime? And this has led me on this historical journey that I want to share with you. Because I think we need to stop for a moment after three magnificent keynotes and hear a few stories. Stop for a moment and think about the imperative that is longer, older than a millennium around this notion of openness, around this notion of sharing, around this notion that the intellectual property of the university is different than Justin's and Joni's and Alice's. Did I mention Margaret Atwood yet? No, and Margaret Atwood. So those differences are, are I can approach in, in numerous ways. I, I'm actually working on a project that goes back to St. Jerome, but I'm not going to take you back all that way. I want to take you back about eight blocks this way to where the academic institution, the academy, is it the academy? This magnificent square and institution, and in front of this academy, my Polish is very weak, 
We've been out of the country for 130 years in my family, so forgive me. But it had something like Academy in the title. And in the front of it was a statue of a man holding a, a compass. And, and, and armorily, I think is the name for it. And that is, of course, Copernicus. Copernicus. He, he's wandered from Krakow. He, he got lost. And he ended up here in, in Warsaw. Fair <laughs> enough. I don't want to play any kind of rivalry here between universities and cities. But I want to focus on Copernicus and this notion of openness. And I want to take you into a chapter of why. But I need to start with a legal distinction around intellectual property. The concept is 18th century. I have a fairly Anglo-centric, Anglo-American-centric perspective, United States and, and, and Britain. But in, in the 18th century, in 1710, Britain passed the Statute of Anne, which is considered to be the first copyright act, the first legal, there were patents earlier. Venice in the 15th century was patenting glass making, but those were privileges. Those weren't rights. Those were granted by the city or the crown as a gift to a craft or a guild. What I'm talking about is a right for someone who has created an intangible product, a text, a work. And in 1710, the Statute of Anne declared that that ownership, by virtue of the labor that went into that property, that ownership has certain rights that need to be recognized. And that right of ownership, without getting into the complexities of natural law and civil law, that right of ownership was a natural law. The author composed. The author, by virtue of the very concept of authoring something, had an ownership claim. But to encourage that author, to encourage and protect that author in creating works of culture, they would have an exclusive license for 14 years to copy that work. By virtue of having composed it, they had created a public good. And this was a breakthrough in terms of legal history. But you know what that intellectual property, that copyright law was called, was entitled? An act for the encouragement of publishers to get very rich and buy Mercedes Benz. No, no, good. I've got some very strong students of history right here. It was not called that, and nor do I think it is. That was a cheap ploy, and, and forgive me, publishers. It was called an act for the encouragement of learning. So we in the university, we involved in the production of learning are at the very center of copyright. This distinction has been lost. We need to bring it back. We're not fighting for open access in some kind of technical device or technical st strategy. We're fighting for a basic principle that was at the very founding of intellectual property, for the encouragement of learning, that print piracy at the end of the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century was such that it was felt to be to the discouragement of learning. Why would anyone write or why would anyone print or sell a book? Let's be fair to the publishers and the work that they put into this. If it's just going to be pirated. And so they stepped in, the legislature, the parliament in, in England, in Britain at that point, stepped in and created a statute that protected the intellectual property for the encouragement of learning. They did more than that. They put in provisions so that the university chancellors could call on the carpet a bookseller and say, you're charging too much for this book. I love this idea. <laughs> I want to be in the room when Springer comes to the table. And I'm very appreciative of Springer. It is among the most open of publishers. But they're still charging $125 for a hardback book. 
And they would be called in front of the chancellor of the University of Oxford and said, this is too much. Are you out of your mind? $125, I could use a, a Polish, but I won't use the expression. <laughs> Heck! It also granted the Statute of Anne, and this is a critical distinction, and this actually was older. This was something that goes back to Thomas Bodley in the Bodleian Library, that every book that was printed, a copy had to be placed in Cambridge's library, and these were called the public libraries, not the college libraries. The public library at Cambridge and at Oxford, in Edinburgh and Glasgow, St. Andrews. A copy had to be taken out of the book market and placed in the commons of the library because learning had to be protected. Had to create, there had to be a space where the public could have access to this knowledge. And this distinction, this idea that intellectual property is rooted not in the music of Justin, but is rooted in the encouragement of learning is something that we need to bear in mind. That we need to think about as part of a larger historical mission that puts the university here, that places us in this beautiful library. A little scary, actually. <laughs> I was a little afraid. I wanted to take a picture to send to my family. I took one step onto this glass bridge. Have you been over there? I couldn't do it. <laughs> the fearless students of the University of Warsaw <laughs> walked right past me into the open stacks and took advantage of the knowledge that is openly available to those who have the courage to take hold of it here. So how did this happen? How is it that when we finally arrived at intellectual property in the 18th century that it was a given that the only way that this could pass, and believe me, they tried to pass it multiple times during the 17th century unsuccessfully, but they got it through on the encouragement of learning. Let me give you a couple of examples of this history that we should be proud of and that we should be concerned about. Let me show you how the openness and closeness of the university is part of a historical process. And I don't want to say that open access is comparable to some of these incidents, some of these events rather, but I want to show you that we need to think about this as a particular moment in the history of the university, a moment where we're making a decision about how we're sharing the knowledge, how open this university is. I was concerned when I saw the library was not on the university campus. I was a little bit apprehensive about that. They've placed the library outside the university. But then I realized that that's brilliant. That of course the first thing we should move out of the gates, out of the walls of the university. You have those lovely brick walls, do you? Do you I, the, there's an old wall around the back of the university as you come down towards the library. Do you know this brick? Yes. I'm not just making this up, I wasn't hallucinating. <laughs> That brick wall has been transcended by the library and that is exactly the message we need. The library should be the public part of the university. The knowledge in this building, for those who are fearless, should be open and available. I was asked to check my coat when I came in. A little bit of confusion at the gate there. I gave them my computer, they didn't want it. I thought they were checking my bag. They weren't checking my bag. They, wanted, they were helping me hang up my coat. I come from a different world. <laughs> so this historical period, I want to focus on a couple of incidents. This is around the 10th to the 12th, 14th century. Let's, let's bring in Krakow. 10th to the 14th century. Gerbert is a monk. The monasteries play a very big part in this, but I don't want to dwell on that. Gerbert is a monk. He's very good in mathematics. He would have had no problem contributing to Gower's blog. He was young. And his abbot, to take care of him, took him to the very edge of I Islamic Iberia, into Spain. And somehow, in that process, he picked up a few tricks with numbers. In particular, he picked up Hindu. 
numbers, the numbers we use today, Arabic numbers as we call them. But the Arabs had picked them up centuries before from India, from Hindu mathematics. And he brought those back and he created an abacus, which we still have images from, copies of from his students that have these Arabic numbers for the first time. This is about the year 980. He becomes Pope. This isn't the normal procedure of taking the best mathematician among all of the Catholic monks and making them Pope. I've proposed it again, but actually I'm quite taken with the new Pope, so it's okay. He doesn't, his mathematics are fine by me. He sees the poor as a multitude and, and good for him. This was the beginning of Islamic learning's influence on Europe. This was the opening for which Sylvester II, as he became, it's interesting, he was named after a boxer. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, no, okay, let's forget. Rocky, no, okay. Young audience, good. Sylvester II picked up these Arabic numbers and he was demonized for it. He, it was felt that he had made a pact with the devil and that these numbers were somehow mystical and that you didn't dare recite them or write them. But that was the beginning. By the 12th century, there was a flood of Islamic learning into Europe. In Islamic Iberia, in Sicily, and in Italy, translations of these Arabic texts were going on. It was a lovely melding of the interests of Nicholas in the humanities, Cameron in the sciences, Stephen in psychology, cognitive sciences, a lovely melding of these fields where Jew and Christian and Muslim would gather around these texts that Islam had been translating from Greek and Persian and Hindu for two centuries before that, from about the 9th, 10th, 11th century, two or three centuries before. Islam had been entirely open, had been eager and thirsty for knowledge and had been translating while the monasteries were closed and had lost Greek and were isolating themselves in the enclosure of Latin. But in this period of the 12th and 13th century, when Europe was starting to awaken commercially, when the first Starbucks opened across the continent, and the marketplaces began to open, there was an interest in these books. They couldn't get enough of these books. And so all of a sudden in Europe, where there are only cathedral schools in the 11th century, only cathedral schools and monasteries, the only centers of learning, all of a sudden, all of the works, all of the extant works, we don't have all of the works of Aristotle yet, all of the extant works of Aristotle are available in the course of a century, of Ptolemy in astronomy, of Galen in medicine. All of these works are translated from Arabic, eventually from Greek, but first from Arabic. And not only are these works translated, but all of the commentaries, Avicentas and Averroes, Averroes, excuse me, uh, the, the Islamic, excuse me, Islamic commentaries are translated. And the Islamic commentaries explain Aristotle in a way that made Aristotle available. And the Islamic commentaries in Arabic were translated into Latin as well. And what happened in this huge opening, with these books pouring into the marketplaces, manuscript culture, one copy at a time, but with great enthusiasm, in fact they would even parse it out and have people copy chapter by chapter so you could get a book in half the time, a quarter of the time, one twelfth of the time. These books were copied and circulated, and I would argue they are the beginning of the university that Islamic learning in that great moment of opening, in that great rush of Islamic, Greek, Persian, Jewish, 
knowledge overwhelmed the cathedral schools. We have lovely romantic figures like Peter Abelard, a story I won't get into to, at the moment, and others who are starting their own schools, who are going into the marketplace and attracting students. And these become the first universities. The opening of the knowledge becomes the first university. Let me give you the other side of the story, though. After all the celebration, Hildegard of Bingham. Do we know St. Hildegard of Bingham? A oh, lovely. Can we sing just a few? <laughs> Can we start the chant? I'll, I'll do the first note. Mm. Hildegard of Bingham is a nun in the 12th century, just decades before the first universities begin in Oxford, in Bologna, in Paris. Hildegard is sealed in a monastery, enclosed in a monastery. I mean bricked in with only a little opening at eight years of age with a cousin or someone accompanying her. And she rises through the ranks in multiple ways. She takes charge of the medicinal garden, conducts experiments with the plants, discovers peyote, no, 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 sorry, it's a, it's a wrong story, discovers cures that brings her to the position of being abbess, composes music, and perhaps most strangely suffers migraine headaches and turns them into cosmography, turns them into a, a cosmological vision. And those visions we actually only have the reproductions of because of a tragic bombing during World War II, but we have in her imagery the way that she handled her affliction. We have in her example from being enclosed in the monastery to her preaching along the Rhineland, to her sharing her medicinal cures that are still, in fact, you can go into PubMed and do Hildegard of Bingham and you will see research continuing on her homeopathic remedies. Why do I introduce Hildegard of Bingham? Because what the universities did within a decade of her death, as they first began to emerge, and they did not begin with formal ribbon cutting, they did not begin in some kind of organized way. They began as guilds, learned guilds. They began as groups of roaming, wandering scholars. But there was to be no women among them. That one of the great sources of learning in the 11th and 12th century was closed out, was left behind, was restricted from participating in the learning. And that when I look around at the audience right here, look around you, And imagine what this would be after Hildegard had run an abbey, after Europe had been populated by double monasteries, male and female, after she had contributed so much, she was excluded. And all of her gender were excluded from the universities until the 19th century. And so while I want to celebrate the value and the contribution of learning. I want to be cautious about our history. We haven't always had it right in the university. We have to make an ongoing series of decisions all of the time. We have to think about who is being included, as Cameron pointed out, and who is being excluded. And that what seems open to us today we have to ask ourselves, will this seem open tomorrow? Will we be judged, as I'm judging the universities of the 12th century? The whole history of Islam, the whole involvement of the Jewish people in the translation movements, all of that didn't work out as well as it should have. That we sometimes take hold of a particular aspect of openness and we forget about the larger picture. So I would ask you just 
after all that you have picked up so far in the talks and all that you will pick up through this afternoon's presentations, as impatient as you are for lunch at this point, I want you to think about this in terms of larger principles. Think about this in terms of a historic moment. And while it might seem not as significant as excluding women from the universities, it might not seem as exciting as bringing in all of Greek philosophy. They had one or two works of Plato and one or two works of Aristotle in the monasteries. But all, the vast, vast majority were imported in the 12th century. It may not be of the same caliber, but it is the same issue about openness. It is the same sensibility about the encouragement of learning. And so when we think about intellectual property and we think about the rights and responsibilities of that property, we need to think about it on this historical scale. And I want you to then, and this is the challenge for today, to put together the particulars of the ideal mandate for archiving and responsible use of publications that Stephen has laid out. To think about the expanse of, of Nicholas's concerns about the humanities and availability of data, and Cameron's interest in a, in a public not just an opening, but a public quality to science, and see yourselves as part of a historical process. That's a lot to do in one day. But just take it in at this point, and then go forth and be fruitful, and please multiply. Thank you.